welcome to the webinar on biodiversity and nature-based solutions that Wageningen University is organizing together with our partners that you can see at the top of the slides. In a bit, I will mention them. We are pleased to have so many registrations. This shows that more and more people are inspired towards, towards a nature-based future and an integrating nature-based thinking in their work. A nature-based approach is crucial to reverse biodiversity loss and combat the effects of climate change. Well, let me start with mentioning the partners that we have in this webinar before we go to the program. We work together with uh, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, Arcadis, Meta Meta, and World Food Forum that will include this webinar on their masterclass webpage. And last but not least, we work together with youth network partners that will also provide the voices of youth in this webinar. So we have the Future for Nature Academy, the Restoration Stewards of Youth in Landscapes, the Dutch Youth Council, the NGR, the International Association of Students in Agriculture and Related Sciences, and the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network. Welcome everybody, welcome partners, and welcome visitors. Uh, last year, we organized the Nature-Based Solutions Challenge, and next year, we will start the Nature-Based Future Challenge. In between, we organized three webinars, and this is the first in line. So what is our program? My name is Miriam Troost. I work for the Student Challenge team of Wageningen University and Research, and I will work together today with David Mornout. He will moderate the session. So David, if you want, you can appear on screen. Uh, David is currently working uh, at Meta Meta and recently graduated at Wageningen University and Research. Uh, we will start this program with uh, three keynotes. First, we hear Liesje Mommer from Wageningen University and Research. Then we have Cas Dinians from our partner Arcadis. And then Wouter Ubbink will speak. He is the UN Youth Representative for Biodiversity and Food. After the three keynotes, we will hear from um, three youth-led projects. First of all, we have Samara Polwata. Uh, she will talk about her project School Meets the Reef in Sri Lanka. Then Levi uh, Siri Sirikwa, he's from Kenya, and he will talk about mangrove restoration solutions. Then Caleb Ofori Boateng, he's from Ghana, and he is uh, very special, uh, the first person to work on amphibian conservation in West Africa. So please stay tuned to hear uh, these stories. Uh, every um, um, presentation of the youth-led projects will be followed by a reflection by the panel. The panel are the keynote speakers. And we also want to uh, invite the audience, that's you, to post your questions in the chat after each pitch. Well, we will, uh, at the quarter, this session will uh, will take place for one hour and 15 minutes. So in the end, I will announce some more things about the Nature-Based Future Challenge that we will organize next year. So over to you, David. Yes, thanks, Miriam. So thanks all. Welcome once again. I'm very happy to introduce the first speaker of today, which is Lucien Mommer. We will start today with an informative presentation on biodiversity and people in the landscape. Um, Liesje is a full professor at Wageningen University, but also leading the Wageningen Biodiversity Initiative. Uh, this is a recent new initiative. It's a network of scientists and stakeholders that works on developing and implementing nature inclusive solutions in the food system, in the landscape and in societies. So Liesje, I'm very happy to have you here and please take the floor to kick off this first webinar. Welcome, thank you. Thank you so much. And it, uh, I see in the chat uh, that we are reaching the whole world. So I'm really excited to, uh, to, to see that there is so much interest. So um, as a take home message, nature-based solutions are great as long as biodiversity and people in the landscape are recognized. So you can also log off now, you have heard the, the central message, but, but I will expand a bit more on that thought. So what is biodiversity? So biodiversity is the variation in species, as you see here nicely depicted across all the continents, but not only on land, but also on sea. I think there is a beautiful amount of uh, 
organisms living in the sea think only on coral reefs and the beautiful types of whales that we have around. It's not only the species, it's also the genotype, so the variation within the species, but it's also the diversity of ecosystems that we mean with biodiversity. And we really need that for a functioning planet. And you may have heard that the state of biodiversity is alarming. Yeah, so we are really losing biodiversity at an alarming rate. There is no discussion anymore uh, by scientists whether this is the, the this is the case. You know we are losing biodiversity, and in a in a way that we are really threatening our own society. So system Earth will continue without uh, without us, but we won't survive if we don't be able to bend the curve of biodiversity. And I feel we really can make a difference. We are able to just uh, change the tides if we start really working with nature. So make more space for nature. So make sure that we have more uh, increased conservation efforts, but also, and it's important, that we have more sustainable production, more sustainable consumption, and that we really start with building or thinking in a nature positive on a nature based way it's not only biodiversity loss that is concerning me uh, in the night but there is also climate change and so we all know also that uh, you know climate change is is uh, is, is uh, accelerating there is this target of uh, 1.5 um, degrees and we really have to work hard to keep it beyond and the the news is uh, speaking so much about uh, you know melting ice and uh, increasing sea levels that that is really of concern and it's important also to realize that these two things you know reinforce each other so more biodiversity uh, loss leads to more climate change and vice versa and you can see this nicely i think in these uh, in this uh, in these figures so and, and it's also making the case of the importance in, in agriculture in our food system. So agriculture is responsible for 80% of the global deforestation. And in these degraded uh, systems, there is also more uh, greenhouse gas emissions coming from these systems. So biodiversity loss leads to increased um, greenhouse gas emissions. And the, the land degrades, things don't want, want, uh, can't grow anymore. And that, so there, this is the feedback loops uh, that, I, that I was referring to. Then nature-based solutions come in. And there is a, lot, a whole bunch of definitions out there. And they have some uh, interesting uh, variation, some interesting diversity, I would say. So one of the uh, definitions uh, that is... Um, is taking, uh, you know, that is, is prominent is that nature-based solutions are solutions that are inspired and supported by nature and should be cost effective uh, with economic benefits. And of course, you know, we have to be able to, uh, to uh, you know, to pay for it, to make it happen. But I think in this definition, a very important aspect is missing. And this, um, 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 and that is incorporated in the, in the definition from the IUCN that uh, define nature-based solutions as solutions that leverage nature and the power of healthy ecosystems to protect people. And I think that is really important that people have a central place in the nature-based solution because I feel that part of the biodiversity loss that we are seeing today is because we are, as, you know, as, as human beings, are disconnected from nature. So I really hope that if we start nature-based thinking, that uh, the people are in, you know, are central that uh, in that in that thinking. Rather than having these de definitions only, there is always a lot of rumor about greenwashing. So there's a lot of uh, sayings that you know, nature-based solutions is is just greenwashing, and big companies, you know, saying that they do some. Uh, some good stuff for, for, for the planet with nature, but at the same time continue, you know, their business as, as usual and uh, they stay, keep uh, emitting um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I think that is, a, is, that is of concern. We really have to make sure we are starting to, to go into the right direction and with nature, inspired by nature, but also, you know, 
respecting uh, the, the nature. We, we really have to go in that direction and just stopping uh, the things going in the wrong direction. So we should focus on, on the way on nature based futures, but stop, you know, doing the bad things. I think it's uh, something that we always have to uh, be aware of. And um, um, by doing so, um, um, we will be able to make things better. And I think given the fact that we have this double crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change, you know, the real nature-based solutions take this into account together. Eh? So it's a double crisis, I, I tend to say, and we have to make sure that the solutions that we provide solve both. And um, by doing so, uh, there, uh, so we should do, we should avoid the bad and uh, harnessing the good. So that means that a good nature-based solution uh, makes sure that there is climate mitigation and adaptation and biodiversity involved. And I think it's interesting to see this, um, this figure, this complex figure from IPCC and IPES. And what it basically says that if you take measures for biodiversity, as you can see here in the bottom, so the, the lower panel shows that the actions, what is the what actions that you can take for biodiversity, they uh, are and how, and what is their effect on the climate. So the upper panel is the climate actions for climate and their effect on biodiversity, and the lower panel is the actions for biodiversity and their effect on climate. And you see in the upper graph there are many red lines and the red lines are not good the 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 the, the blue lines are the good ones and you see that the actions for biodiversity only have a few uh, red lines and many blue lines and so this is this is not a one-to-one -one, but it's really important to realize that any nature-based solution should be good for us at least trying to find the right balance And I think that the second aspect uh, that is uh, important in, in this, as I said already in the very beginning, it's not only about climate mitigation, adaptation and biodiversity. It's also really important to, you know, to construct and to develop these nature-based solutions in connection with local communities, because it's the people in the landscape that will have to live with it and it's important that they also have a say in it. And it's not only some companies that uh, that make some money, but that is really, you know, that these nature-based solutions are embedded in the landscape and the people are really living the landscape. And that is my last slide. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks a lot, Lisha. That was uh, very informative and inspirational. And I fully agree that uh, nature-based solutions should be about climate, biodiversity, and people, at least. Um, let's move on to some biodiversity and nature-based solutions, nature-based approaches in practice. I'm welcoming Cas Dingens from Arcadis. Cas uh, is a marine ecologist, uh, but next to that, he has been involved in the nature-based solutions that we have been organizing at Wageningen. Um, he has been mentoring the team School Meets the Reef. You will hear more about that later. Yeah, hello. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, yeah. David. I thank you, Alicia, for your presentation about uh, nature-based solutions and the introduction. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Cas Dingens, and I work at Arcadis, uh, which is a consultancy firm, uh, and I will show some uh, projects in practice of nature-based solutions. And I will be doing a, s a small quiz whether you, where you can vote, whether you think it's a nature-based solution or not. Um, and just a small, uh, well, not an introduction, but maybe a bit similar to what Lisha said. When at Arcadis we talk about nature-based solutions, uh, we, well, there, let's say differently, um, nature can be used in a variety of ways. So you have got nature-derived solutions, nature-inspired solutions, which take inspiration from nature, for example, for the architecture, uh, or nature-derived solutions, which use natural sources, for example, wind uh, or solar energy, uh, and for the benefit of people. But today we'll be talking about nature-based solutions. And these nature-based solutions uh, use the function of ecosystems and provide natural services to benefit both the environment, but also society, uh, as Lisha said. 
And at Arcadis, um, the nature aspect in nature-based solutions is often caused by the use of sediment or vegetation uh, in projects. Um, and nature-based solutions can occur in combination with gray infrastructure. And these gray infrastructure are hard uh, civil engineered uh, infrastructure. For example, a dike, as you can see here on the left. Um, and you can combine these with, for example, uh, vegetation-based uh, solutions as well. But sometimes you do need a gray infrastructure because you, for example, have to protect uh, the land that lies be behind the coast and you need a, a dike. Um, and at Arcadis, we often see nature-based solutions in three categories, cities, coasts, and rivers. And in cities, you can think about uh, urban forests, for example, or urban farming. Uh, at coasts, you can think of mangrove forests. I think that's a uh, known example. Use mangrove forests to protect uh, the coast, but also the people living behind it, and they can use that as well, uh, the, the habitat over there. Um, and in the Netherlands, you often see sandy shores as a nature-based solution. Uh, and for rivers, you can think of uh, natural inland wetlands or river and stream uh, renaturation. And in the Netherlands, you've got a big project called Room for the River, which uh, falls in the last category. Um, and then these nature-based solutions provide well, a variety of services and benefits for well, biodiversity and nature, but also uh, social and economic uh, values and aspects. And I think that's important to uh, highlight. Um, so now we move on to some case studies here that we've done at Arcadis. And um, I will be showing you an example of a project. Uh, you can vote there, there whether you think it's a nature-based solution or not. Uh, you can do that as soon as you see the picture of the project. Um, or you can maybe change your vote. I don't know if that's possible when I explain the project a little bit. Um, and then we'll see what the answers say. I don't know if they are on the screen when I talk about them, but we'll see. Um, so the first one is Marke Wadde, which is in the Netherlands. And um, Marke Wadde lies in Marke Meer, which is a lake in the Netherlands, uh, a, a very shallow lake where the water circulation is very uh, poor. And uh, there was a loss of habitats for bird species and fish species during all those years. And they created a few or several islands to uh, improve habitat and create new habitat for those birds birds and uh, fish species and other species. Uh, and also people can use them for uh, recreational uh, value and people can go to some of these islands uh, for tourists, for example. So uh, I'm wondering if you think this is a nature-based solution uh, or not. Uh, I see that the polls are showing that um, it's it's nature-based. Uh, most people agree that it's nature-based, and I, I agree with that as well because there is a variety of, uh, well, ecological, but also social and economic uh, benefits to it. Then we move on to the next one, which is in Katwijk. And Katwijk is a city uh, or village <laughs> in the Netherlands close to the coast, and the um, safety levels, the coastal safety levels were lacking there, so they had to uh, create a dike. Uh, and you can create a dike in front of the, the dunes or on top of the dunes, but what they did here was create a dike underneath the dunes, um, which raised, well, which protected the village, um, but also created some, as you can see here, some, some dune habitat in, uh, in front and on top of the dike. But as you can see at the, at the right picture, um, it's civil engineered as well. So there's really this great infrastructure part to it. Um, and this, Dyke also um, acts as a parking garage for local people, the residents, but also for tourists. So I'm wondering whether you think it's a um, nature-based solution here or not. And I can see that the polls are quite mixed, <laughs> about 50-50. Um, I, I think this is a good example of a nature-based solution with the use of gray infrastructure, like the, 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 the combination. Uh, I can understand that um, there are some doubts here whether this is a proper nature-based solution or not. Um, but I think you do create habitat, uh, dune habitat, and you do provide a service uh, for people, even though it's only a parking garage, but they can use it. Uh, and you still have the benefit of coastal protection, which is, of course, huge as well. Um, then we move on to the next one. It's also coastal protection, but at the other side of the Atlantic. 
uh, in New York, Staten Island, and it's called Living Breakwaters. And as you can see the picture, it's mm, quite gray and not a lot of nature. Um, but to protect the area, they uh, also put in these boxes at the right, you can see here, which contain shell fragments. Um, and these shell fragments are used uh, to attract fish species and to create breeding grounds. Uh, but as you can see, the, the main part of it is a uh, gray infrastructure um, dike or what a breakwater. Um, so I'm wondering what you think here. And I can see here that most people disagree that they think it's not a nature-based solution, about 60 to 40 percent. Um, and I agree with that as well. I think this is on the a start is made to become nature-based as in the sense of the nature part that protects the, the, the people behind it, of course, but there's not a lot of added social value. And um, the nature part, they started with it by creating breeding ground for, for fish species, but I think you can do more by creating uh, or also planting or, or introducing uh, grasses, for example, or create salt marshes or whatever, uh, and also improve the social uh, aspect in this project. So I would say uh, no to this um, <laughs> this example. Um, how long do we have I've left? I'll, I'll do the salt marshes as well. This is also in the Netherlands, at the north side of the Netherlands. It's a bit similar to Marco Water. Um, and due to uh, sludge man uh, management and the morphodynamics at, uh, at this area, the salt marshes were uh, eroding away. Um, so what they did here was create 15 hectares of salt marshes to provide breeding grounds for birds and um, other species, habitat for other species. And it's uh, for use of uh, recreational value for uh, people. Um, so yeah, I wonder, or I'm not wondering, I see that most people agree that this is a nature-based solution. I think so as well, but if you compare it to Marco Water, for example, I think the social value and economic value here are a bit less than uh, Marco Water, uh, but in, in, in the sense it, it's a nature-based solution. Um, then we move on to the next one, a mangrove island in Curaçao. And the mangrove islands that, that, of the mangroves were lost at Curaçao. Um, and what they did here was create new mangrove islands, basically. And these mangroves provide a variety of services, such as biodiversity and coastal protection. People can use it for timber and fuel wood, as you can see in the top right there. Um, and it was, yeah, so it's, uh, I'm seeing that people 100% agree that this is a nature-based solution. Uh, I think, of course, uh, yes, it, it, it's a lot of nature-based, but it's, made, it's basically nature restoration. So where, at some point, where, when is it, do you call nature restoration almost nature-based solution? I think it's a, um, I think yes, because you use nature in the solution, but um, if you destroy the mangrove forest in five years time, and then after that you create a mangrove, it's nature-based, but is it, um, yeah, it's nature restoration. So just think about it. But I think it's a nature-based solution. And um, then we move on to the last one, Rio Chiate Linear Park. Uh, it's in Rio de, of, uh, <laughs> Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, and it's a channel there, and it's used for drink water and, and irrigation, um, and it goes through the city, and it, it's basically a concrete channel, but they start to, starting to slowly develop it into a, a linear park along the banks of it, as you can see at the bottom here a little bit, you can see a bit of green, um, and this, these parks, the, the people and the, the communities can use for uh, recreational as well um so yeah i'm seeing that uh, two-thirds think it's, it's a nature-based solution well it's declining now a little bit and um, i think this is a nature-based solution as well and but the, um the thing about this one it's, it's it's in a city so in the city it's harder to be to really incorporate the nature aspect sometimes in a nature-based solution and um, and that's why I think it's it's very mixed. Uh, well, see, it's 50-50 now, and very mixed uh, uh, answer, basically. Um, but I think this is also nature-based, but it's a, a start. Um, 
to something bigger maybe as well. Maybe it's a good start, but something more has to happen. Um, and that is it for me. I have one more, but I don't know if I have time left. This <laughs> Uh, we don't really have much time left, so. But Kas, thanks, thanks a lot for showing these examples, and it's important that we together think about what we see as uh, good nature-based solutions, or even what we see as uh, nature-based solutions. Um, now I would like to introduce you to Wouter. Wouter is UN Youth Representative on Biodiversity and Food. So to protect, protect biodiversity, we need to also change our food systems. Oh, well, that's what Wouter is working on while defending the interests and opportunities of young people. So thanks for being here, Wouter, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion about uh, yeah, what constitutes uh, nature-based solution and whatnot. So I will be here um, uh, talking a bit about the role of youth. I was asked to say something about why is it important that you are involved in biodiversity at all? Um, and um, I, uh, I have prepared five reasons for that, uh, just to uh, um, show some of them, uh, because I think youth and biodiversity are connected in many ways. Uh, the first of all is, is, well, biodiversity is important for everyone, right? Uh, for the whole of humanity. So why wouldn't youth uh, also be involved with biodiversity? Second um, is that um, the concerns about biodiversity will, of course, only uh, are still increasing, um, unfortunately. And its effects will, of course, also mainly be felt in the future when we, our youth, uh, will be still around. So it's also something about the future that we as youth uh, are concerned with. The third reason is that, of course, we are a majority. Uh, more than half of, the world, it, half of the world population is under 30 years old. Um, but at the same time, the average world leader is, 59, is a 59 year old man. Um, so youth should claim their rightful place as a majority shareholder in our planet and in our future. Um, the fourth reason is that, of course, youth are creative and they have innovative ideas about, um, uh, uh, yeah, these these kinds of problems. Uh, uh, and we will take a look at some of them uh, in a very short time by some of the participants. And then the last reason is a little bit more of a story. So I think also that youth are often, they often hold fairness and justice in very high regard. Uh, and to, I will give an example, uh, which I saw in uh, Montreal in Canada. I was in Canada for the COP, for the Biodiversity Conference uh, of the United Nations. And on the, on the uh, penultimate day, the, the, the day before the last day, they wanted to adopt the framework, new biodiversity framework, to which almost all countries had agreed. But there was one country left that had not agreed yet and was still um, trying to change some things about the framework. That was the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And um, because all the countries agreed and uh, people just wanted to finish it, the presidents of the COP decided to just adopt the framework without the agreement of, uh, of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and many people, uh, and I was around uh, in, the, in the place where all the uh, countries sit, and many people cheered and they were very happy that the framework was adopted and they didn't really seem to care that there was one country uh, that didn't agree with the proposal. And of course, the Democratic Republic of Congo is not just a country. It's an enormous country with a lot of biodiversity, a lot of rainforest and also a colonial background. Um, and then I walked to the youth, the place where all the young people were sitting uh, in the hall. And they were not really happy, actually. They were confused and also said that the democratic process had not been really triumphed. Um, and I must also say that uh, as a youth myself, I was also a bit disillusioned. Um, but um, the youth were also hopeful that the agreement could have been made without uh, with the D DRC. And they were right about it because the next day, uh, the DRC and the presidency seemed to have made a reconciliation um, and the adoption was uh, was fine. And that's exactly why we need youth in biodiversity, in the biodiversity debate. Young people care about fair practices. They know that biodiversity crisis is something that we cannot, that we can only solve together. And we cannot just leave people behind. Um, and some people would call that naive. Uh, they think the way the, the world, the way the world rolls is just how it is. But I think that's very brave. And I think that's uh, something we, uh, we need in our future. 
Um, and certainly uh, in the view of our biodiversity crisis, we need uh, young and brave people uh, to step forward. Um, and uh, fortunately, we have some of those brave and young people here today. And uh, I, I very much look forward to hearing their proposals for nature-based solutions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Wouter. Um, well, thanks, Wouter. It was very inspiring and good to hear also uh, your personal experiences on that. Well, let's move on to the next part of the webinar, as actually also introduced by you, Wouter. The pitches from the young people working on nature-based solutions and uh, biodiversity, of course. Well, we will have three pitches. The first pitch is by Samara. So, Samara, you can uh, join the stage here. And uh, Samara is from School Meets the Reef from Sri Lanka. She has won the Nature-Based Solutions Challenge with her team. And currently, she is also a global restoration steward. So, Samara, uh, good luck with your presentation. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, so it's it's been a great pleasure to be part of the um, you know the Wageningen Student um, Challenge because it was the main reason how we managed to get into the field of you know working with nature-based solutions and applying it to uh, the coral reefs. So um, I'm here representing my team, School Meets the Reef, uh, which is um, a team of five members, and of course. Um, others who have joined in hands to work and make it a successful project. Um, so as you can see, our project has two parts, school and then the reef. So I will talk a bit more about it um, as we go on. Um, so as I told you, like uh, we got into the challenges, student challenge last year, and we were thinking about what kind of nature-based solution can we apply in the context of Sri Lanka because at the time we were going on a situation where the country was in economic crisis and the government did not really have any resources or funds to actually work on things that can actually enhance biodiversity um, and me being quite familiar with the area um, of coral reefs and restorations doing surveys for a few years we thought the best solution that we can bring in is to this overlooked site, uh, which is called Calcutta in uh, Batiklo district. This is situated on the eastern coast of Sri Lanka, uh, which is highly overlooked and uh, not been managed properly. And some of the reefs have been bleached and damaged by many reasons. So if I give an overview about the importance or the biodiversity that we can find in this area, is that um, there are five major coral species uh, ranging from Acropora branching corals to big dome corals such as parietes and many uh, reef fish, uh, around 200 and reef fish in this Calcutta site and also quite around the area as well. And one thing very important is we have an endemic parrotfish called, called uh, Colorus rakura, which can only be found in the eastern side of uh, Sri Lanka, which, which is endemic to our country. So it's a very important site, therefore uh, must be taken into consideration. And two endangered turtles are also laying eggs in this area. Um, so it's a very important site and an overlooked site as well because uh, it brings a lot of deal to the people in the area for the blue economy. A lot of people depend on the fisheries, uh, ornamental fishing, and also tourism, which has started to begin after 2009. And the other important thing is, of course, the coastal protection that it brings. Uh, but the problem, as it, I have to mention, there are a few threats. Um, we have so many rivers in the small island which are going into the ocean, and this releases a lot of nutrients and a lot of sediment, which can damage corals and other coastal ecosystems. Um, on top of that, the other threats that uh, this particular site faces is uh, damages to the branching corals, for instance, from fins, acne dynamite fishing, these kinds of um, unhealthy activities. So we thought this is the perfect site for us to select and start our restoration. Um, so with uh, our work beginning in last uh, July, we thought um, in order to maintain uh, these different aspects of, you know, uh, making sure that we, we touch upon things that can improve climate change and adaptation, mitigation, also looking at the disaster risk reduction pros uh, prospect, upliftment of the blue economy, all these things taken into consideration, and also improving the marine biodiversity in the area. 
and maintaining sustainability in the long run, it's important that we rehabilitate the coral reefs and also part down. Um, I can give you an example. In the southern coast of Sri Lanka, we used to have a large like acres and hectares of coral reefs, which were damaged, which were mined, uh, because people were not aware of the importance of it. And this mining industry only stopped after the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. So we don't want such a you know, disaster to happen again because people were not aware about the importance of safeguarding these reefs. So bringing it into the school curriculum is also a major part of our project. Um, so just to highlight here, um, our project looks at this particular methodology where we used um, concrete, uh, recycled concrete uh, reef balls. At the moment, we have only put three, but in the second phase, we are hoping to expand it. And they, um, two species of corals were attached to this, Acropora and Parites. Uh, we also had a nursery there. And um, on the day that we did this particular restoration, it was quite turbid. Uh, but during the next sessions, because we kept on continuously monitoring this site, um, so on the first monitoring session itself, we could see that small polyps, especially in Acropora, starting to grow because it's one of the fast uh, growing coral species compared to the other dome um, shape varieties. Um, so we kept on doing these monitoring sessions because these are very important uh, because there's a lot of sedimentation. You could see the differences in the pictures. There's a lot of sedimentation, a lot of algal cover coming in, which needs to be um, taken out so that the corals are not smothered. So we uh, managed to do four monitoring sessions so far. Two months we had to, uh, we couldn't do because of uh, it's the off season. We can't really go into the water at that time. So the working and hence why we want to expand it further. It's a cost effective method, which is a very important part to consider. Um, then moving on to the ocean literacy for young stewards. We not only focus about the coral reefs here, but also the integration of all the other um, coastal ecosystems like mangroves, um, salt marshes, seagrass in the area. So we did uh, several sessions in the vicinity taught the students about the importance of taking care of these um, ecosystems, did some interactive sessions because although these students live like two kilometers from the reef, some of them have never even seen underwater. So it was really uh, inspirational for them to actually understand. And we did an introduction to scuba diving as a conservation methodology as well. Um, so these are the major parts of our project. Um, so I always, always have to say that uh, this was not uh, successful so far if it was not a partnership with all these people, the fishermen community, because it was at a time when we didn't have fuel to bring the, you know, these reef balls into the water and we had to use this traditional technique, uh, this particular boat, as you can see in the picture, to drag these um, reef balls into the water. That support was taken from the fishermen and their responsibility was, you know, given for them to keep on maintaining um, these reef balls, uh, to take care of them. That responsibility was passed on. So there was a lot of uh, organizations within Sri Lanka that we made uh, hand in hand with which was very important. Um, and then, of course, these are my team members. Uh, I'm not the leader or anyone, but I want to say that we all work in harmony. And during the time uh, when I was not in Sri Lanka, the other people who were there, they worked really hard to make sure that the project uh, is working. And we are looking forward to the next phase of our project. Thank you very much. And these are some questions that I wanted to post. If you uh, think about it, uh, if there's any questions also, please let me know. Thank you. Over to you, David. Yes, thanks a lot, Samara. We also put those questions in the chat so the audience can answer them, but also let the other folks know. But I would also like to invite Lisa to provide the reflection. Yeah, I just admire your project because it's so beautiful. I think it's it's also such a good example of what Wouter was talking about, of the power of youth and the power of connectedness and the power of stepping forward together and uh, and and you know make it happen. So so I you know 
I, I always tell my students here that, uh, you know, if people are cynical and it is so difficult that, uh, you know, the only thing you can do is making an, a new step. And for me, it's very, you know, heartwarming to see that, that you, um, you, you, um, you know, you work with the local community, with different stakeholders in the community. I think that is really important. And, and, and I think what is so special is that you really implement the education part of it because if you just if we are able to just nudge the minds of people and that they you know they start seeing the beauty of a coral reef and i cannot imagine anyone not being you know you know amazed by the beauty of 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 underwater that will that you know that is the best ever thing to to change behaviors of not throwing away plastics and and whatever is threatening your system. So I think that is, uh, you know, I just admire you. And, and I think it's also for the audience good to know. So I think at least I came to know, know about your story from the, from the student challenge. But, you know, within half a year, you made it to the COP in Egypt. And, you know, you were talking to, you know, all the political leaders that, you know, are really doing it. But, but you know, you as, as youth really have the power to change it. You know, I'm just sitting here next to Kaz, and he is also really proud of, you know, having helped you. And so I think that is where where the change comes from, from this uh, connection. So I wish you all the luck and 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 keep going. You you know, you know, it's the energy, it's the you know, the conviction that you can change the world, that will change the world. So thank you so so much. Thank you for that. It's really a pleasure. Uh, I have to really thank Wageningen University, Miriam, um, Cass, everyone for this. So, yeah, <laughs> hoping for the next phase to start soon. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, both. Um, let's move on to the next presentation. And for, uh, yes, perfect. Thank you. And the next presentation is from uh, Ludivis, and he has over a half a decade of experience in coastal and marine resource management, and specifically in the active restoration of degraded mangroves. So we also just heard Cass uh, about the mangroves in Curaçao, if I'm correct, but now we go to uh, Kenya, because Levis, he co-founded the Syriops Research Environmental Organization, he works on several projects in the blue economy. And on top of that, he is also an ocean restoration steward. Uh, so, Levix, I think you uh, are in the room. So, please open your microphone and camera um, so you can get started with your presentation. Yes, I see you're joining the room. So, the floor is yours. Yes. Good to see you, Olivis. I just introduced you. Maybe you missed that when switching from the room, but the floor is yours. You can get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Levis Sirikwa, and I'm from Kenya. Thank you very much for the uh, previous uh, insights on nature-based solutions. So I am from Kenya, and I represent Siriops uh, Environmental Research Organization. Syriops is a non-profit uh, youth-led organization offering uh, the best mangrove uh, restoration solutions uh, um, in Kenya. So one thing that uh, we are facing, the problem we are facing uh, in, can in, in the country is uh, massive degradation of, of, of mangrove ecosystem. And we believe that uh, when the, the habitat is, uh, is destroyed, so are the livelihoods. So that means that uh, the, the, the positive correlation uh, means that the more, ma the more mangroves are cut, then the more uh, the communities living adjacent to the mangrove ecosystems uh, uh, lack or lose uh, livelihoods in the aspect of uh, uh, what the ecosystem goods and services. So what, what do we do? The first thing that uh, we have thought as Syriops is um, we want to attract the bees. So we are using bees because bees, one, bees are, are keystone species in the mangrove ecosystem. And also bees are primary uh, pollinators in the mangrove ecosystem. So the, the trees are available and the bees will produce uh, the bee product. Um, honey, for example, and these uh, products 
are going to support uh, to, to benefit human beings in terms of the nutritional value of, 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 of the honey. And the other thing, the uniqueness about this is that the ecosystem will be uh, restored ecologically by itself because uh, when the bees uh, support pollination, more, more seedlings um, are able to be produced and, and the mangrove, the, 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 the restoration or regeneration of the mangroves is accelerated. So that is an approach we are looking at. And then also it, 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 it's, answer, it's answering the aspect of uh, increased livelihood and in, increased income, both to the community and to the, the, to the active players uh, in the mangrove ecosystem. So the other thing, the other option that we have taken in as CIOPS is uh, actively uh, restore the degraded ecosystem. Because if we leave it to regenerate by itself, it may take a lot of time. And yet we have a demand on the, on the goods and services from the mangroves. So we mapped about, we have mapped about 1800 uh, hectares of degraded open space and uh, we are targeting about 7.5 million planting um, uh, these trees to be able to re restore, actively re restore um, the degraded ecosystems. So we have put together two models. So the first model is, um, is a, we call it the $1 model. So our model is Mikoko na Jami, uh, which means Mikoko means mangrove and Jami means community. So these models are informed by science, they are data-driven, and they are techn technologically inspired. So we invest in quality seedlings, and then uh, uh, we follow specific uh, standard operational procedures for planting, and then we monitor. So our focus as CIRIOPS, we want to grow the trees and not just to plant. So by being able to monitor these trees, it means that we, we get to understand uh, how they grow, and then we are able to monitor. The second model is uh, where we incorporate a livelihood aspect to the to the uh, to the grown trees. So we call it greening the blue. So um, once we have planted, we monitored for about eighteen months. We attach uh, the livelihood component or a sustainability program to conserve, support the community to conserve, and motivate them to continue protecting the mangrove uh, uh, ecosystem. So the additional part is where now we are seeing, we, are, we want to attract the bees to the forest by installing hives. So the first model, uh, one thing we have done is to enhance accountability. The $1 that is given in the first model is accounted for from this different uh, targets and aspects to ensure that uh, to ensure that uh, every everything in the in the mangrove space is 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 every role is 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 allocated resources and it's it's done. So we work hand in hand with the community to ensure that all these needs are addressed and resources are are, are allocated. For the second model, this is where we have the aspect of investment, return on investment. So we have various uh, case scenarios depending on, 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 on the interest of the partner. But the bottom line, the benefit sharing here is 50-50. The 50% that goes to the community is the farm gate price that um, a farmer will be enrolled and then they will, they, will, they will be supported, trained on how to produce honey. And then when they sell the honey, syrups and the, uh, and the investor work together to ensure that they do value addition to, to, to get the returns from the investment they have put in. So this is what the slide talks about. Then our social impact. When we restore one hectare of mangroves using the second model, we have we will have like uh, installed fifteen hives, uh, uh, supported uh, community supplementary programs. It could be microfinance or circles, and and put together at least forty five casual jobs. And in the process, we also like uh, support uh, education. Uh, then our impact, we started off in 2019, and I must say that um, we are addressing uh, several SDGs. SDG number one, no, no poverty when you provide livelihoods. SDG number two, zero hunger when you have livelihoods, then people can put food on the table, the aspect of food security. SDG number 13, 
climate action. We all know mangroves play an integral role in uh, uh, carbon sequestration. Then uh, SDG number 14, life uh, below water. Mangrove ecosystem is part of the critical um, marine habits, habitats. Okay. So this is our team. Our team is, 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 is made up of young, resilient, uh, innovative, vibrant, passionate people to their role. Uh, so um, our partners are as follows. Um, uh, they have, we've been able to work together to do some restoration. However, our main partners are Kenya Forest Service, uh, the government and the community through community uh, 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 community forest associations. So um, it's good to point out that without Kenya Forest Service and the community, it's very difficult to actively uh, restore the mangroves. So the question that I would have for us um, is um, how would you define the blue economy at your own capacity as a stakeholder? Then do you think uh, we are on the right track as, as young people uh, based on what has been presented? And then also, what would you recommend? So thank you very much. In case there is any question, uh, free, feel free to ask. Thanks a lot, Levis. Excellent, good to hear. Um, let me invite Cas to stage for a reflection. And also we put your questions in the chat so everybody is able to respond to them. Yeah, uh, thank you, ladies, for your uh, pitch. I think it's a very nice example of uh, a nature-based solution. It's very uh, cool to see as well how fast it can go. And uh, within a few years, we would have, what was it, 150 acre of hectares um, of mangrove restored. Um, and I think it's also very nice to see how you how the um, local people uh, are involved in the project, um, how do you create uh, a li livelihood for them, um, and that you also look further than just restoring or uh, placing mangroves, but also look at the, the pollinators, the bees, and look at the, the bigger picture, the, the ecosystem as well. Um, so yeah, yeah, very cool to see. <laughs> um, yeah, what else? Um, how can I say that? Yeah, I think over, overall it, it's just a very um, cool, cool uh, project, and you're you're on the right track. You're, you're definitely on the right track. Um, and like the, the school meets the reef team, inspiration from a project like this is is very big. I think for for me at least it is. Um, so yeah. Keep, keep on going with something like this, with a project. I don't know if the other uh, speakers want to add something here. Yeah, I saw a question in the chat about the, the species of mangrove trees. Maybe you yes, I can, I, I, can, I can answer that. Yes, uh, we are restoring, uh, we are using about four species. Uh, the first one is Syriops tagal, the yellow mangrove. The second one is Rhizophorum pronata the red mangrove. The third one is uh, Brugeria gymnohiza, normally referred to as the, the, the black mangrove. And then um, Avicinia marina, the gray or the white mangrove. The attempts to do Soneratia alba, uh, Xylocarpus granatum, Xylocarpus molucensis, and, um, and Heritera littoralis. We are actually doing a research to be able to include those added last three species in the, in, in the NASA. So those are the species that we restore. Great, thanks a lot for this uh, elaboration. And um, actually, do we have room for one more question? And I also see one question popping up in the chat, so that's perfect. And um, the question is the following. Would it also be interesting to monitor the fish, et cetera, returning into the ecosystem? Yes. Uh, we have plans for that uh, because we are working with different ecosystems. Like we have, we are working with the urban mangroves in Mombasa, and uh, the mangroves in Kenya fragmented. The other place is uh, is Kwale in, in in the southern part. So we are putting together proposals to be able to uh, do some research to to confirm that. All right. Thanks a lot for those elabor elaborations. Um, 
So ladies, if you uh, could also maybe put your contact details uh, in the chat, then uh, people can also reach out to you. Uh, but for now, I request you to close the step and re-enter the webinar so that we can welcome the next speaker. But thanks a lot, uh, Levis. Excellent. Okay. So okay. our next guest is Kaleb. And Kaleb, he actually made his own accurate and comprehensive list of all amphibians in Ghana that made him one of the first uh, biologists in Ghana to research amphibians. And next to that, he has won the Future for Nature uh, Future for Nature award in 2014. So during Caleb's fieldwork, uh, he found species that actually had never been described before. And even more surprisingly, he rediscovered amphibian populations that were thought to be extinct. So Caleb, very happy to, uh, to have you here. The floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you very much. And a very good afternoon to uh, all of you around the world. Um, yeah, so it's such a short time, so I'm just going to go into the slides. I assume I was introduced already. Um, so I'm going to tell you why amphibian conservation. Uh, 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 okay. All right. So, all right. So a bit of a story. Um, I was I was born into a national park. Uh, literally, I grew up in a national park. Uh, my father, which you can see in this uh, old photo here, was a, a park ranger who rose through the ranks to become a park warden. Uh, and so I, I spent my childhood uh, having this amazing interaction with wildlife. But I also had a very special bond with my father because he, you know, he took care of me. Uh, he would take me to wild places to spend some time and look at all these amazing uh, wildlife species. But unfortunately, when I was only seven years old and he was uh, only 45 years, uh, he, he, he died under very mysterious uh, circumstances. And, and I felt the vacuum, you know, uh, of losing such a, a dear loved one. And as a child, I really didn't understand what it means that somebody has died. And I felt like, you know, there must be something that I could do uh, to bring him back. I was thinking that if I, I made a lot of money as I grew up, I could find a way to, to restore that relationship. It was later, you know, when I grew up and uh, understood that death is irreplaceable. And so as a person, I'm very sensitive uh, to things that cannot be replaced, um, such as species extinction. And this is what led me to, to amphibian conservation. So as you can see, uh, you know, I wanted, uh, I came across in 2005, the fact that amphibians were going through a mass extinction. Uh, and I was surprised that nothing was being done in my country about it. I thought that this should be headline news. These animals are going extinct and nobody cares about them. So I knew that I needed to act and I needed to do something about them. But of course, being the very first person in my country to have this crazy idea of working to save so-called slimy animals, uh, it was a, a very difficult task. I had to begin by trying to do an inventory of all the species we had and their populations and how to prioritize which one to focus my conservation attention on. And this was very interesting. And, and along this career path, I've been fortunate to describe, discover and describe several new species, including my favorite one here, which is the one that's uh, called the Fiaprago uh, puddle frog, which I named uh, after my dear uh, mother. Um, now, one important discovery that we made as a team was the rediscovery of this frog called the Togo slippery frog. Um, the Togo slippery frog, it's an evolutionary distinct species. It can crystal like a human being. It's amazing. It's really a very amazing frog and was believed to be extinct for uh, almost 40 years until we rediscovered a very small population. When we discovered this population, it was already um, you know, regular food for the local people. Uh, and there were only about 156 individuals in the area that uh, we found them. So I knew that I needed to put a plan in place if this species will be saved. And so I acted um, accordingly. But of course, another threat was also the cutting down of the trees. Uh, this frog required a forested 
uh, rivers that have forests around them to be able to survive. And this forest vegetation is very important for their breeding. And these trees were uh, frequently locked by the local people. Now, how do you get people interested and involved in doing anything at all to save a frog species? This was a very challenging task uh, as a young conservationist. I, I did a lot of study in this community and I realized that the community is very polarized. They don't trust themselves. They don't trust any information. It's very easy that you be tapped as being uh, of one political fashion or the other. But on the other hand, the community is very religious. They go to church and most about 98% of them. And I decided that using the avenue of the church to put across my conservation message was probably the best thing to do. And I can say a lot about this, uh, but basically this is what I did. By visiting the churches and making an appeal to them and trying to use scriptures and Quran verses that talk about conservation and the need for us to act. In response, okay, so I cut five years of work into this single uh, slice. Uh, in response to years of work with these communities, establishing volunteer groups, schools, outreaches, et cetera, et cetera, the local people donated a lot of land for us to protect this frog and other animal species. So now here and in the green, uh, the core areas of this reserve, about 12,000 acres in all. And this protects the water sources of over 20,000 people and protect 12 uh, additional IUCN threatening species. And this was all donated uh, freely by the local people. Now, unfortunately, most of the area donated have already been uh, heavily degraded uh, in the past by different activities, logging, farming. And so our uh, nature-based uh, solution uh, to this is to work with all these local people to replant the forest. And we are replanting the forest with three main considerations. We are replanting native trees that have huge economic benefit uh, to the local people, including this apple that you see here that is already flowering, uh, and these other precursor trees. And then we are also planting back some of the critically endangered species of trees that have been lost in the landscape. So we're achieving the biodiversity target. We are making sure that communities have benefit from our tree planting. And of course, it, it, it brings a lot of job to the local communities as well. Uh, here we show some of the trees that were planted just two years ago along some of the rivers that the Togo slippery frog inhabits and it's already doing amazingly well. Well, the last thing that we have done to support our project and the community is to uh, develop an ecotourism product which has been a game changer for our project. Uh, it's called the Amejope Canopy Walkway. In the chat, you can look at all the amazing videos that we have on Instagram and, and on YouTube. And this uh, ecotourism project brings, it's estimated to bring about 20,000 people to this village. There are days that we have as much as 800 people visiting and 60% of the revenue goes to the landowners who have donated land for this project. Uh, to build schools and, and provide clean water uh, for the people. So, well, um, there's so much I can say with our project, um, but the time is so short and I, I will have to stop here, but I look forward to uh, hearing your questions and um, yeah, and, and chatting some more if time allows us. So you go to the chat, um, I believe it's already there, and then you can uh, learn more about our project, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much. Carla, thank you so much for your a very inspiring uh, presentation and I also took a look at the resources that have been sent in the chat. Very nice visuals and uh, other other uh, resources, so thanks a lot. Uh, let me ask Wouter to give a reflection and meanwhile the chat is open for others to also think along and to provide their reflections. Wouter? I'm not hearing you yet. I do see you. But uh, you are still muted. At least in the chat, I can already see some very positive responses, responses to your presentation, uh, Caleb. But I think Wouter's uh, 
mic is working maybe now. Ah, I see the audio button doesn't work. Uh, maybe I can invite uh, some of the other speakers in the room to provide a reflection and still, meanwhile, the chat is open. Yes, Lisa. It's such, it's such an, an, uh, a touching story. I, I feel how you, you know, how you really feel, you know, in your story, you really feel how you, you know, your memories of being a child in that area that where you really, you know, learned the, with the love of your father, the love for nature and how you turned it now in your daily practice and, and how you also diversify step by step and grow the project step by step. I, I, I can only admire how you do it and how you do that, you know, together with the people and and you know, I can only. I was thinking of how uh, how it would be to see you on your in your field field work, you know, trying to uh, hunt for the frogs, and 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 I think you will also, um, you know, recognize some maybe by by sound. Yeah. So so I I can imagine that that is really very very special to be to be out there in the wild and and you know. And how cool to see that because of your efforts, you know, you are just restoring this big part of nature in, in Ghana. And it's only one of the few uh, countries in Africa that I have been in. I know how beautiful it is. So I have sweet memories and I can only say that I, I you know, this is so brave because it's also, not, I know that also how, how much it takes day by day to, to really get it going and, my only concern is that you know, don't bring in too many people because if it's if you have more people than the village can accommodate, that's a pity. So maybe you should try to, to you know, that would be my my hope for your project that you don't destroy that single village. But maybe you know, maybe the next step is to expand to another area where you could take that approach, or maybe to other areas in in uh, in western africa where you can do it but big compliments and i can only bow deeply for your courage and you know and I, it's just so beautiful to see that it starts with your deep love for nature and your deep love for your father it's really touching thank you for sharing thank you yes thank thanks you. uh thanks i think my audio is working uh, now oh, Walter, we still don't hear you still don't hear me no How about it? we do i hear you I now we hear you, yeah. Okay, I think uh, I hear from uh, someone else that I am uh, audible. Yeah, and Caleb is not, Caleb's not as well. So I'll just start. Um, okay. Sorry about that. So David, I don't what, know what do you do? You want from us? So, Lisha, if you can uh, turn off your microphone and speaker, then I can give the floor to Wouter once. Yes, thank you. So, Wouter. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, but I don't know what happened. I just the audio didn't go on, but uh, I uh, I rejoined, and uh, yeah, I think Lisha said most of it. Um, it. It was such a beautiful story, Caleb. Um, it was such an authentic story. I always, when people focus on like a, a very specific group of animals in 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 some country, uh, that's that's really cool. I think it really shows your passion, um, and also it's such a personal story and. Uh, I get the feeling that you use this this personal story uh, in your conservation efforts because uh, you go to you also said um, you were um, involved a lot in the in the religious community um, and that's really playing to your strength and using this personal story um, which is so beautiful to to help nature and, uh, and and I think that's really unique and I think it's really uh, cool and I also think it's a very good example of how we really need whole of society you know. Um, we need every sector, we need every community to help in the separate of biodiversity because it has to do with every, almost everything in, in our society. Um, and religious groups are part of that as well. And I think they're often ignored, um, but, but going uh, towards them and seeing that they have such a central role in this place, uh, uh, in the environment um, and, and yeah, uh, taking that up and, and think, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna join this community and, and talk about this. And using that personal story, I think it's a very smart way and very innovative way to to do something for nature. Um, so yeah, I'm, I really hope that um, 
that uh, it's it. I, I see that the, the plants uh, are growing well. I hope also that the the, the number of forks and toads uh, are also increasing. Um, that that would so that be something I, I would be interested in. Um, but uh, yes, thanks so much for this for this very moving story. Yes, I fully agree with that. So thanks a lot, Dr. Caleb. Um, it's time for me to give the word back to Miriam to uh, provide some more information on the upcoming nature-based future challenge. So Miriam, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, uh, David. And thank you so much to all of our speakers and all the hopeful stories that we have heard today. I think everybody will agree uh, on that. Uh, with this, we have come to the end of this webinar. Um, yeah, for myself, the biodiversity and nature-based solutions journey started with a nature-based solutions uh, challenge last year, where eight teams like the School Meets the Reef team of uh, Samara in Sri Lanka uh, started their projects. Well, this year, year we are organizing some webinars and masterclasses. And for next year, we invite all youth uh, student teams to partic participate in the nature-based future challenge. You see it on screen now. It's uh, the, the assignment is to design and visualize a nature-based future for the Bangladesh River Delta in 2000. Uh, we'll ask you to design maps, visuals, and transformation pathways. Uh, there is a lot of uh, information already available on the website. So I invite you, uh, I will ask uh, David to put it in, in the chat or I will do that later on. Um, but very quickly, the timeline. So we are now in the in the webinar phase, and in November 2023, we start uh, the registration. We have a pre-select, some pre-selection moments, and then the grand finale will be in June 2024. And uh, well, we all expect uh, many more inspiring projects by youth. So think about it. We will uh, send all of you an email with the recording and also with some more information on the nature-based future challenge. Um, yeah, with this, I want to end the webinar. Thank you all for your attention. And we will close off with the video about the Nature Based Future Challenge and hope to see you in the next webinars and, and as a participant in the challenge. Thank you so much. Wageningen University and Research presents the Nature Based Future Challenge. A global competition for the brightest young minds to create a better future for all. Climate change and biodiversity loss are amongst the biggest challenges of our times and put our future food security under threat. To ensure a prosperous future, there is a strong need for transformative change towards a nature-inclusive society. This calls for new, out-of-the-box solutions, nature-based solutions. Therefore, Wageningen University and Research calls young changemakers from around the world to develop an innovative perspective for future generations for one of the most dynamic regions in the world, a river delta that is one of the world's most densely populated and fertile areas with an abundance of wildlife and mangrove forest and extremely disaster prone. The Ganges Brahmaputra Meghna Delta in Bangladesh. The Nature-Based Future Challenge. Join us to create a better future for all. Develop a nature-based future vision for the Bangladesh Delta.